means he has to have big things for you to bring it to... that is impossible for God. No, I'm considering he's the one who has given me his word. He's the one who's given me his promises. He's the one that has to bring it to pass. Amen. You can go ahead and be seated. In the book of Acts, the second chapter, I'm going to read to you beginning at the 14th verse. It says, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, he raised his voice, and he said to them, Men of Judea, and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out of my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vaporous smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The 32nd verse says this, This Jesus God has raised up, of which were all witnesses, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you see now and you hear. Now that's talking about something that was going to take place. Peter was actually quoting what had been prophesied by the prophet Joel many years before that about an event that was going to take place and that was when the Holy Spirit would be poured out upon all flesh. And he began to tell us some of the things that we would see when the Holy Spirit was poured up on all flesh. Men having visions and dreams and, and prophesying and, 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 and signs in the heavens, signs in the earth beneath. And then it says this, it says, And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. <clears throat> when you see those things, everything that when you look at that, everything that that is pointing about, or talking about, or trying to draw our attention about, is that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you realize that the signs of, 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 of prophesying, having the visions, having the dreams, the signs in the heavens and in the earth beneath, that those are all signs that are pointing to something. They're pointing to a God of creation, and they're pointing to Jesus, and actually in a lot of ways they're pointing to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, he even said that it was in the last days. That's pointing to a specific time that in the last days God was going to pour out of his spirit upon all flesh. So we see it's all talking about something and what would take place in the last days. But it comes down to this, and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Acts 1.8 says, and you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. What is this all about? What are these signs about? What are miracle signs and wonders about? What are the gifts of the Spirit about? What are healings and bodies about and that we're going to see in these last days on a major scale? What is the glory of God coming into a building and filling the place that people can't even stand to minister? What is that all about? It is all about pointing mankind to a God of all creation and a way that we can have a relationship with Him and it's only one way and it's through Jesus Christ. Matthew 13 44 says this, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again and then in his joy he went and he sold all that he had bought, all that he had and he bought that field. Notice how important that was or let me say it this way, notice how precious the kingdom of heaven is. So precious that when a man, he compared it to a man who found a pearl and he went and sold everything he had to find so that he could buy the whole field. 
The kingdom of heaven is precious. The things of God are precious. And they need to be precious to us. Romans 14, 17 says this, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Notice we just read how Jesus said about this man who found how precious the kingdom was. And now notice what makes the kingdom so precious. Do you realize that there are things that we find in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and we are kingdom people. And we have a different king. We don't serve the kings of this earth. We honor and respect them. But we serve the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And we are just passing through this place. Now notice what is found. What is it that is different about this kingdom? It's righteousness. You can't get righteousness anywhere else. You cannot become good enough. You cannot become righteous in your own ways, in your own works, in your own means. There's only one way that you become righteous, and that is you have to be born into this kingdom. And it's righteousness. It's peace. Man, how can you put a value on peace? There are people, they are spending good money they're seeing doctors. They're, they're abusing substances. They're doing all these things to find peace. And yet in the kingdom that you and I are part of, it contains peace. Thank God for peace. Man, I tell you, there's people who would give anything to have the peace. And we have a peace. It's called the peace of God. And it passes all understanding. It means that it's a peace that is available. Not just the peace is not the absence of conflict. The peace of God that is found being in the kingdom is that in the very midst of the worst conflict that you could ever find yourself in, the worst news, the worst things going on all around you, where it looks like everything is just an upheaval and everything you've stood for is not going to stand in the very midst of that, this peace of God that passes all understanding. It comes upon you. You can't explain it. You can't buy it. A doctor can't prescribe it to you. You can't get it any other way. But if you are a kingdom person, if you've been born into this kingdom, it is available to you. Right. Now notice that righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Have you ever noticed that the world is always looking for a way to have fun? It's all about, I mean, it's, it's amazing. It's all about fun. I mean, I mean, I remember, you know, there was a lot of things Mary and I couldn't do. Especially when we were raising our kids because a lot of things took money, right? But yet we had to find ways that we could have fun. And now I see a lot of people, I mean, they just, I mean, you know, everything's sped up. Some people, they just have to go, 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 go. And they're trying to find pleasure and trying to find joy in that. But that joy, I tell you, that kind of joy, that kind of pleasure lasts about this long. It's so short-lived. But there is a joy that's available, and it comes from being in the kingdom. And it's joy in the Holy Ghost. There is a joy that is found in the midst of no matter what you're going through, in the midst of everything in upheaval, in the midst of circumstances that it looks like you ought to be having a pity party and crying yourself to sleep at night. But there is a joy, and it's unspeakable, and it's full of glory, and it comes from being a resident or being a part or being born into the kingdom of God. Thank God for this joy. Now notice what Jesus said. He gave us instruction Actually, what we're supposed to even do, we're supposed to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto us. Isn't it interesting how the world has turned so many things upside down and they're seeking food? They're seeking clothes, right? Isn't that what it talked about? Isn't that the context he was putting it in? They're seeking all the ways to have their needs met. They're doing this. They're pushing every lever and, 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 and pulling every lever and pushing every button. And yet it seems like that nothing has, nothing has changed. Could it be that our priorities are wrong? Could it be that when we begin to seek first the kingdom of God, that all these things begin to be added unto us? I can't tell you how many times in my life that when I would get my priorities right, <clears throat> God would come through. And my, my priorities, what do you mean by having your priorities right? Well, let me just help you here real quickly. We'll do a little review. Number one is God is first place in our lives. And our lives should revolve around God. And our lives should revolve around the things of God. 
Our life should revolve around the, th the, the things of the Word of God. Our lives should revolve around the things of the Spirit of God. God should be first place. I know we can all, we can all agree with that, but can we all put it in place and live it? I mean, we all need to be reminded because it's easy to have other things come up in life. And before you know it, God is no longer first place in your life. God gets knocked down the list. And we have, if we have just a little wee bit of time at the end of the day, maybe we can do something with God. If we have just a little bit of time, maybe we can, maybe we can clear our calendars enough to meet together as the church like the Bible told us to do. He said not to neglect the assembling of yourselves together, but so much the more as you see the day approaching. But, 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 but is God really first place? Because if he was, there were some things we wouldn't be neglecting anymore. I know this is good. Thank you for that one person that's in agreement. You see, when things are out of order, it's out of order. And when things are out of order, things aren't going to work the way they're supposed to work. It's kind of like, have you ever, <clears throat> I suppose men are probably more famous for this, but ever, have you ever gotten something that you had to put together? And you just pulled out all the parts and you just began to put it together. And when you got it assembled, you looked in the box and there's still parts in the box. And then you realize the thing doesn't work right because it came with something called instructions. And when you follow these instructions and you do it step by step, Right? You do it step by step, and as you follow it step by step without skipping steps and doing it in the proper order, when you are finished, you will have what it's supposed to be like on the front of the box. But if we get things out of order, we're not going to have the product, we're not going to have the goods, we're not going to have the thing that we were putting together, the thing that we were building or assembling, it's not going to be proper. And it's the same way in life. If we don't have our lives properly ordered according to the Word of God, it's not going to go well with us. It's not going to go the way that, we, that God has intended it for us to do, for us to go. So he said that we are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto us. That kind of sounds automatic to me. Doesn't it to you? Doesn't it sound like that when we get things in the right order, that when we begin to put God first and we're seeking his kingdom? Now let me just, I, I like the way one man said this, that what it really means is seek first the kingdom of God, or we could say this, God's ways and God's way of doing things. Let me say that again. We're seeking God's way, not our way. We're seeking God's way, and then the way that God would have us to do things. And isn't it interesting that if we will seek God's way, and this will be the first thing that we will do, most people, this is the last thing they do. They find themselves in a jam. They've done it their own way. You know, that's the theme song in hell, just to let you know that. I know this not by divine inspiration or revelation. But you remember that song? I did it my way. That's the theme song of hell right there. But we find, we find out, we just got to lighten it up a little bit in here. We find when we do things, when we begin to do our things our way, then that doesn't mean that we're doing it God's way. And isn't it interesting that if we will do it God's way, and we'll seek him first, we'll put him first, we'll find out his way of doing it, and we will do it his way, and our heart becomes kingdom-minded, and our thinking becomes kingdom-minded. You know, if we even get like that, our selfishness will start falling off of us. We'll no longer be, leaving, be living for ourselves, we'll be living for others. And we'll be willing to do some things that we don't necessarily feel like our flesh wants to do because it's not about us, because we're seeking first the kingdom of God. We're seeking first the building of the kingdom of God. We're seeking first the lost so that they can be saved. Now, so if we do this, if we seek first God's way and God's way of doing things, he said all these things will be added unto us. That's why the Bible talks about that the blessings of the Lord, they come upon us and they overtake us. Well, that reminds me of like when you're driving in a car, right? And somebody comes up behind you real fast. And if you don't speed up, they start flashing their flashers at you. And you know, some people do that. They get real impatient. You ever have that happen to you? And then all of a sudden they overtake you. That means they pass you. And I believe that when we start putting God first and we start operating in the kingdom principles that he's given for his kingdom people, that when we begin to do that, we don't have to be out there looking for blessings. 
We don't have to be out there looking for all the things that the Gentiles seek. I'm telling you, we're just going to be going along, doing kingdom business, being kingdom-minded, and all of a sudden, we're going to look out the rear of our mirror and we're gonna say, oh, look at that blessing. Here it comes. Oh, glory to God. Seeking first the kingdom of God. His righteousness. All these things being added unto us. 2 Corinthians 4, 7. It says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. The Amplified says it this way, However, we possess this precious treasure. Now, what is this precious treasure? What is this that Paul was talking about? He was talking about the gospel. The light of the gospel. Notice he's saying that is a treasure. A treasure is something of great worth or value. A person esteemed as rare or precious. He said that we have this precious, precious treasure. And it's found in earthen vessels. That's mean we are earthen vessels. Amplified, let me finish reading this. However, we possess this precious treasure, the divine light of the gospel in frail human vessels of earth, that the grandeur and the exceeding greatness of the power may be shown to be from God and not from ourselves. Have you ever thought about being a kingdom-minded, light-carrying Christian with the gospel, which is simply the good news, you know, let me just say this. I think sometimes we think that, that, that preaching the gospel is standing up with a big crowd and sharing the gospel and how people can be saved. But really, the gospel, the word gospel means good news. And you can share the gospel without giving a whole 15-point sermon. You can share the gospel with people that you meet every day. You are carriers. Amplified says you are carriers of this light. And this light, this gospel, this good news, it is precious. I remember years ago there was this, there was this evangelist. Well, at the time he wasn't an evangelist. He had been kicked out of every high school in town. And um, his name was Eastman Curtis. And his dad ended up putting, in a, putting him in a boarding school. A, a boys' boarding school, because of his behavior, and he'd been involved in 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 in, in, in smoking weed from a small child. His dad used to own uh, jazz clubs, and he used to go and hang out at the jazz clubs. And they called him Sticks because he loved to play drums. And he got to meet all these jazz guys. Well, with some of these jazz guys, I mean, they were into smoking weed and stuff. And he started at a really young age. And he started getting into all this trouble. And he was known, man. If he was known as he's the guy, he's the go-to guy. He's the go-to guide if you want to find weed. And so anyway, he got, he got saved while I was in this boarding school. He got, I mean, he really got saved. I mean, really got saved. You know, you know why you say it? Because I see so many people who got saved, and I see that they, if they really got saved, I, they wouldn't have enough evidence to convict them of the crime of being saved. There wouldn't be enough evidence in their life that would point out that they really got saved. I don't know what it is, but we need, we, need to peep, we need people to really get saved. Really get saved. I mean, do you remember the, 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 the parable of the, of the ten virgins? And only five had enough oil? And, 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 and they were the ones who were there when the king came back? I said something when the Keatons were here, and I said, I, said I, I hope that's not prophetic. And they told me after the service that both Brother Hagin and Brother Lester Sumrall believe that that is prophetic, that 50% of the people who say they're waiting for the bride will not be ready when he comes. But he really got saved. Eastman really got saved. And so, uh, you know, they used to come over to where he was in his room, and that's where, that's where they always partied. So he's out there advertising. He say, man, come on, I got some good stuff. He said, I really got some good stuff. You need to come to my room. Come on, we're going we're gonna to party. I got some good stuff. He said, you know, he's got all his friends showing up, and he's got a brown paper bag. And he said, man, I got some good stuff. And they're, yeah, I want to see him. And they're all thinking, man, he's got some good weed, you know. We're going to get high. And so he had them, they're all sitting there waiting for him, and he opens the brown bag and he pulls out a Bible. <laughs> this is a true story. He got his friend saved, and there was a revival that broke out in that area because of him getting saved. He was known as a troubled youth. 
I tell you, troubled youth just need a dose of the Holy Ghost. They don't need to smoke any weed. They need a dose of the Holy Ghost. They need to be filled with the Spirit of God. There is no high like the Most High. You can look far and low and up and down, and the Most High high is free. There's no charge for it. It's already been bought and paid for. It's legal. It doesn't make you slow. Doesn't make you have munchies all the time. Gives you the ability to overcome your flesh so you can tell the munchies no. How did you get me all off on that stuff? So we have this treasure, this, this gospel message. We also have the Holy Spirit. Man, he is a person. He's not a thing. He's not an it. He is a person. I think sometimes people think Pentecostals might give too much emphasis to the person of the Holy Spirit. And so let me just lay a couple things out here to help us think through this. We know this. We know that God is in heaven. Isn't that right? We know that God has never left heaven. We know that he's seated in heaven. We know that there came a time he had a plan for the redemption of mankind. For all had sinned and come short of the glory of God. Fellowship had been broken. It started in the garden with, with Adam and Eve when they sinned against God. And so God, he had created mankind. Mankind was a different breed of creation. The angels even said, who is man, God, that you are mindful of them? Man was created in a different class than angels. And so God created mankind, and because mankind sinned, he knew that he had to come up with a plan, which he already had planned from the foundations of the earth, from the foundations of the world, that he could rejoin with mankind. And so we know that he sent Jesus. So Jesus was God. Jesus became flesh, or God became flesh, and he came to earth as a man. He lived his life on earth without sin. He never messed up one time. He did what you and I couldn't do. That's why he was able to take our place. The punishment, the whippings, the, 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 the sin being laid upon him, the poverty being put upon him, all those things were what you and I should have had put on us. It was put on Adam and Eve through the curse or through sin. And it came down and it came down and it came down and all of us should have had that. But then this man called Jesus... This God-man, this Jesus, this God in the flesh, he came to the earth and he walked out his earthly walk and he never sinned one time. That's one of the things that makes his blood so precious when he, when he, when he, he uh, shed it for us. Another thing was is that he wasn't born by the seed of man. His seed came from God into a virgin. I know people want to people wanna argue if the virgin birth took place or didn't. It. If it didn't, then you might as well just hang up your salvation and go find something else to do. And so, and so here, he, here he is. So Jesus comes on the earth, and he says, I'm going to walk this plan out. He was a man just like us. He was tempted to give up. He was tempted to quit. He was tempted to sin just like you and I. But yet he didn't fall for any of it. He was crucified. He was raised again from the dead. And he told his disciples this. He said, I'm going to send another one in your place. In my place is what he meant. I'm going to send somebody else in my place. Another comforter is what Jesus called him. And he said, and he is going to be with you. Now when he said be with you, he didn't mean just his disciples. He meant he is going to be with all of us. Do you realize this, that Jesus, he laid aside his deity. He laid aside his rights and his privileges as God. That's a good way to say it. I'm going to say that again. He laid aside or he set aside his rights and privileges as God when he came to earth. When he came to earth, he did not operate as God. He operated as man. Oh, if people could get this. He operated as man. A lot of people don't understand. They think because Jesus did the things that he did on the earth, the only reason he did them was because he was God. No, he did them as the son of God, but he laid those things Aside, He laid aside all that power, all that ability, until something happened. Jesus didn't do anything spectacular or supernatural. 
He didn't do anything that was miraculous until after that the Holy Spirit came upon him. Do you remember that? He was being baptized in the river Jordan by John, and the Spirit of God descended upon him like a dove. So, when that uh, descended upon him as, as a dove, we know that he was led by the Spirit and he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. And then we know he came in and he, he, he stood up before the, 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 at the Jewish synagogue. He found what was written of him. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me. You know, to preach the gospel, to heal the brokenhearted. To, and, and so he, 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 gave his, he gave his mission. He gave his life's mission statement. This is my mission statement. This is why I'm here. This is what I've been called to do here. Acts 10.38 says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. He needed to be anointed. God needed to anoint him with the Holy Ghost before he could go about doing good and, and, and heal the oppressed. Does that make sense? So here Jesus, Jesus uh, he didn't do any mighty works. The Bible says he didn't do any miracle. His first miracle he did was in Cana when he turned the water into wine at a wedding. It said this beginning of miracles, right? That was his very first miracle that he performed. He didn't do any miracles until after the Holy Spirit had come upon him and enabled him. So what I was getting at is that God the Father is in heaven. Jesus Christ, the Son, it's God the Father, Son, the Holy Ghost, the three in one. Triune, Trinity is the word that we use. They're separate but equal. They're separate but equal, and they all make up God. And so here you have, so then Jesus, the Bible says that he is seated at the right hand of the Father. We know that he's still there because when Stephen was being stoned, do you remember that? Stephen had preached a really good barn burning message and, 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 and was telling them how they had crucified the Son of God. And, and, and instead of people getting excited and getting saved like they did in Acts, well, the, the third chapter when, when, when Peter stood up and preached, you know, after, after in the day of Pentecost and they heard him speak with other tongues and 3,000 got saved. And he preached a very similar message, but nobody got saved. He didn't even, I mean, his flesh didn't get saved. And so they picked up stones and they began to murder him. They began to kill him. And he said this, it says, and he looked into heaven and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Well, that means Jesus was in heaven then, right? He saw Jesus standing at heaven and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. This is what, what, Steve, what uh, Stephen said to God. Don't hold this against them. But my whole point was Jesus was in heaven. Jesus wasn't on the earth. And he was standing. That's kind of exciting, isn't it? That he was standing when, when, when that's his place is to be seated. I believe he was up there cheerleading. Go, Stephen, you preach it. Keep preaching it. Keep preaching it. Don't back up. Don't deny me. See you soon. I'll be waiting for you. To be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. I know there's people that believe in purgatory, but you can't find it anywhere in the Word of God. It doesn't exist. It's not there. So here then, so then Jesus says this. He says, I'm going away, and I'm going to send another comforter to you. So we know that then Jesus is in heaven right now. He's seated at the right hand of God the Father, and he's making intercession for you and for me. Don't you like that? That means that he is going to God on our behalf. I love that. That means that when he sees Pastor Kevin struggling, he's up there saying, God, he's one of ours. He's been born again. My blood washed him and cleansed him. He's, look at he's in the book. His name is written in the book. God, we need to do something for him. We need to do something on his behalf. And here's the Holy Spirit. He's waiting for instruction from heaven. And Jesus says, okay, God, that's what we're going to do. And he says, Holy Spirit, this is what we need to do. There is a chain of command. We won't go there today. But. So let's talk a little bit about the Holy Spirit. Now, I know if you come to this church, you hear a lot about the Holy Spirit. We are a Holy Ghost church. What is a Holy Ghost church? Well, I'm glad somebody asked. 
A Holy Ghost church is where we preach the Word of God. We preach and teach the Word of God. A Holy Ghost church is where we not only preach and teach the Word of God, but we allow the Holy Spirit to move. That's a Holy Ghost church. Some people get in the ditch because they have a Holy Ghost church and they never preach the Word. Listen, the Word is always, always, always going to be the foundation. I don't care how long you've known God. I don't care how many years you've walked with Him. It is always the preaching of the Word of God. If you look at the ministry of Jesus, it was this. What is the ministry of the Lord Jesus while He was on the earth? Preaching, teaching, and healing. Or we could say a move of the Spirit. It was always, 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 always the Word. Always the Word is first place. A Holy Ghost church always has to have the Word first place. Always. Doesn't mean that there's services. Doesn't mean we don't have services where the Holy Spirit moves and we don't preach the Word that service. You know, I, 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 we used to know people, I mean, they, 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 that's all they wanted. Every single service is all they wanted was just a Holy Ghost blow up. But you know what? We have to go with God's order. We have to go with God's order. Some, there's some services, all he wants is the Word of God preached and taught. There's some services where he doesn't want the Word pro preached and taught. He just wants to move by his Spirit and minister to people. There's services he wants to do both. He wants to have a combination of both. But our thing is, is that we just want whatever God wants. As a Holy Ghost church, we want God, we want whatever he wants. Do you realize that if you are preaching and teaching under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it is God moving? And in addition to that, Brother Hagin always taught us that when the Holy Spirit isn't moving, it's always right to preach or teach the Word because the Word is anointed. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and He became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus was called the Word, but in the beginning He was the Word. So the word, is, the, the, the word is always right. As a matter of fact, we have to know the Word if we're going to have a proper relationship with the Holy Spirit in our lives. The Word is what will keep us balanced. The Word is manna from heaven. The Word is milk. The Word is man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds forth from the mouth of God. Um, it's important that we have the right diet of the Word of God. I mean, if you're like me, if you could have it your way, it'd be banana cream pie every day. Right? And there would be times you just wouldn't eat. You'd have dessert and forget the main entree. And it's the same thing with the Word of God. The Word of God, is, it's a, there's a balance to it. There's a balance of feeding on the Word of God. Um, you can become unbalanced with the Word of God. In fact, the Bible even warns us about it, that we will see that in the last days, that there's going to come false teachers, and there's going to come Christians who have itching ears, and they only want to hear what they want to hear, and they're going to find them teachers that will tickle their ears or teach them only the things that they want to be taught. Tell them only the things that they want to hear. But that's not a balanced diet from the Word of God. The balanced diet is, I mean, there's times you've got to have broccoli. Right? You've got, you got to have veggies. There's times that you've got to have fruit. I mean, your natural body, when it becomes deficient with certain nutrients and vitamins, it begins to affect you. Your spirit, man, I'm telling you, there's things when it becomes deficient and certain things, it is going to affect you spiritually. Brother Hagin used to say this, kind of taking me back to what I started today about are we really putting God first? He said, isn't it interesting how men and women will feed their bodies three square meals a day and one little snack of the Word of God once a week? Well, that's telling me what's, what's, what's first place. You see what I'm saying? Us feeding our spirit man needs to be first place. Feeding your spirit man is more important than feeding your flesh. I know it goes over big on a goes over big when we're talking about having barbecue here in a couple hours. Right? But it's true. And so you have to have you have to have the right diet. You have to feed on the word of God. You have to feed yourselves the right things. 
Now, as a local church, as a pastor in a local church, I'm considered a shepherd. I am not the great shepherd. I am the under-shepherd. Jesus Christ himself, head of the church, is the great shepherd, but he has appointed under-shepherds. And so as a shepherd, it is my responsibility to feed you. And so what am I supposed to feed you? I'm supposed to feed you whatever it is the Lord has placed in my heart to feed you. And if I will be faithful to do that, if God has connected you to the sheepfold, then you will be spiritually balanced. If you come regularly and if you plug in, then you will be fed a diet that has been ordered by the greatest dietitian ever known to mankind, and it is Mr. Holy Spirit. Dr. Holy Spirit. I don't belong to the, to the, to the uh, Sermon of the Week Club. I can't tell you what I'm going to be preaching next year on this date. You know, there's people, they got it all laid out. I can't even tell you what I'm going to be preaching Wednesday night. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. There's times you can have series. I'm not against that. But I'm just telling you, it's important as a shepherd that I'm hearing from the great shepherd because he knows what nutrients, he knows what you need to be fed that is going to help you. You know, that's one of the values of a local church. There's people, they just bounce here and bounce there and bounce there. And they wake up in the morning, just, you know, what church am I going to go to tomorrow? Well, you know what? You'll never be balanced. You will never have a balanced spiritual life. I'm not saying you've got to come to this church. I'm just saying if that's what you're doing, find the church that the Lord wants you to be a part of and plug in and become the hand, the eyes, or whatever. Put your hand to work in the, in the helps of ministry, the ministry of helps. And feed on whatever is coming, whatever is being fed you. Now that doesn't mean that you can put all the blame on me as your shepherd either. Because if all you're doing is coming and getting this buffet, I believe it's a buffet, that's my own personal opinion. A buffet that we lay out on, 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 on uh, Sunday morning. It's not all you can eat because some of you can't even, some of you just, you know, nibbles enough right now. <laughs> just playing. Forgive me, Lord, I'm just having fun. That's that thing I was talking about last week that I, I have to work on. And so, uh, <laughs> got to confess your faults one to another that you may be healed, right? And so, but, but this is the thing, if, 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 if as a Christian, if you want to grow spiritually, if the only time that you are, are, are hearing the Word of God or looking at your Bible, of course, nowadays our device... Or following scripture, if, that's, if the only time you are doing that is when you come to church, you are not going to be balanced spiritually. It's not enough. It's not, you know, bro cream, just a little dabble do you. It's, it's not enough. It really is not enough. Not if you're going to live at the level that God has called you to live at. Not if you're going to be balanced what do you mean by that? Because when you grow with God, when you walk with God and you grow with Him, you will realize that there are areas in your life where you've got to have more. You've got to have more understanding. You've got to have more faith. Schaefer was talking, you know, God's not moved by your need. He's not moved by your situation. He's not moved by the mountain you're facing. He's not moved by those around you. He's only moved by one thing, and that is your faith. It's faith that moves God. He's looking. He says, in fact, it says when he comes back, will he find faith on the earth? He's looking for faith. And when he sees faith in operation, he will move. And so we realize that, that, that you know, as a shepherd, I'm feeding the flock. It's interesting how, how, how if I'm hearing from heaven, how people will, people, uh, it won't just be one person that gets something out of that. If you're connected to this church, probably all of you will get something out of what I share. Some of you will say, well, that was just for me. And it was for you, but there was others too. See what I'm saying? But that's not enough. Because you can have strong faith in one area and have weak faith in another area. And if you're just going to wait and, 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 and oh, I hope pastor talks about that area so I can get faith. <laughs> no, you, 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 you go after it. You go after You come here and you feed. Awesome. Still waters. Green grass. I mean, tables spread before, before our enemies. I mean, who even knows what's all on that table? Yeah. Right? I mean, all, all that's good. But, but man, you need, to be, you need to be feeding yourself. Let me just say this, that, that you can start this 
by faith, meaning that you really don't have a hunger per se for the Word of God and spending time in the Word of God. But I challenge you, do this. Do this for two weeks. Every day, get in the Word of God. Every single day, get in the Word of God. God, what do you want me to see? Lord, what do you want me to strengthen my faith in? Do it every day and come talk to me after two weeks and tell me, tell me that you don't have an increase in hunger for the Word of God. It's kind of like I never liked salmon. And then I started eating again later on in life, and now I actually like salmon. There's times I crave salmon. See, that might be the word isn't that tasty to you. But once you start feeding on him, your spirit man, I'm telling you, if you could see your spirit man when you feed him, I mean, he's, he's I mean, by Sunday afternoon, he's ready to be fed again. Now, I know you, you're going to go and you're going to eat lunch, and most of you are going to eat something tonight. Well, your spirit man, you're going to get fed today, but tonight your spirit man, he wants more. If you could see your spirit man, I, I, I liken it to uh, Pac-Man. You know, remember the Pac-Man game? Do they still do Pac-Man? When I did Pac-Man, it was Atari. It wasn't even mine, it was my younger brother's. And, uh, but like Pac-Man, it goes... I mean, that's how your spirit man, if you only realize how much your spirit man craves the word of God, how hungry your spirit man really is. It's kind of like you cannot even feel like you're hungry and then you taste something or you smell something. Or we talk about something like we did earlier, and all of a sudden, your, your stomach starts growling. You didn't even realize you were hungry until you went there. Your spirit man's the same way. Once he tastes and sees that the Lord is good, he's got to have more. And so you have to feed your spirit man. Let me just give you something, just a very simple idea here. What is it that is challenging you? What area in life is it that you are looking for a breakthrough? What is it that you are believing God for? Well, I'm not believing God for anything. Well, see me after church. I'll give you some things I'm believing God for. You can help me believe God for. Every person in here ought to be believing God for something. Every single person. I challenge you, if you're not, you believe God. You write it down what you're believing God for. Then once you find out what it is you are believing God for, you have to begin with this. Does this line up to the will of God? Because you cannot believe God for something that you don't know it is his will to have. Faith begins where the will of God is known. Once you know the will of God, then you are at a place that you can start your faith journey. What do you mean by that? I know this is God's will for me, so I'm going after this. I'm going to believe God for this. I'm believing him to come through. I'm believing for this need to be met, whatever it is. Why can you do that? Because you know it's God's will that you have it. If you don't know it's his will, you'll never have faith for it. Because you'll be hope. Man, I hope this is what you want for me, God. I hope this is available for me. I hope that you come through me, come through for me. Faith is, I know this is your will for me. I know you're gonna come through for me. It's a difference. And so and, and, and so here it is. So you find out what is it you are believing God for. Then understand, well, if I'm going to obtain it, just like Hebrews 11, we won't go there. If I'm going to obtain the promises, then I'm going to have to obtain them by faith. And it's all right to have an honest conversation with yourself. Lord, I'm really not there. Lord, I just, my, my faith really is not there. This is why I always encourage people, you start right now where you're at. If you need to believe God for $5, you believe God for $5 because that's going to add to your faith. And when it gets to the place where you need to believe God for $50, you'll have so much more confidence and trust. You believe God for five, he came through, he's going to do it for 50. Just talk to David. It was the lion and the bear and then the giant. And so, and so you find out. You spend some time and you find out, okay, this is what I'm believing God for. Now, where in the word, say the word, word. where in the word can I find where it says that I can have this? Where in the Word, where in the Bible, does God promise this to me? And then you go to, and you find that Word. And you meditate on that Word. Well, how do I find that Word? If you have access to Google, you can find every word in the Bible. I've got a Bible app. Before that, I had a big Strong's Concordance. I mean, it kind of reminded me of the old Bibles that people put on their table that they never opened. 
right? The family Bible. And that thing was like holy. I mean, it was like, never read what was in it, never walked in its principles, but bless God, we got that big old kill a moose Bible in the (laughs) coffee table in the living room. We enshrine it, you know, put it under glass and light it up. And, but don't you touch it and don't read it. I'd get up on So what you do, you can go, you can get on Google. You can find Bible. And you can search every word. Let's say you're believing God for healing. You can search and it will bring up every single scripture that contains the word healing in it. Or heal. Or healeth. If you want to go King James Version. And it will bring everyone up. And then that's what you begin to feed on. What do you mean feed on? You feast on it. You set your eyes on it. You look it up. You read it. You read it in context. You read what came before it. You read what came after it. Bible interpretation 101. We interpret scripture with other scripture. You find other scripture. Don't find some, some you know, out of context scripture, Jesus wept. And then go and do likewise. I mean, you know, <laughs> you, you, no, you, you, you find it in context and you begin to feed yourself. The way that you feed yourself on the word is through the eye gate and through the ear gate. You know, one of the greatest ways, it's good to listen to other preachers. It's good to listen to, I mean, I've got, I've got DVDs and, and CDs. I've got stuff that I've listened to over and over and over again and listened to it. But you know, one of, one of the great, greatest ways to hear it is you saying it. So you feed on it and you're looking at it in your eyes and, and you're speaking it. And it's getting down in your heart. It's great. You want to get it in your mind because it begins to renew your mind. Let me say it this way. It reprograms your mind. You begin to think like God thinks, right? Your thought life begins to get in agreement with what God said in his word. But what you really want it to do is you want it to get in your mind and renew your mind, but you want it to drop down into your spirit, man. Faith is of the heart. It's not of the mind. It's not of the five senses. It's not what you can see, feel, hear, touch, or taste. It's not of the five senses. Faith is of the heart, just like love is of the heart. It's been shed and brought in your heart by the Holy Ghost. And so what you've got to do is you've got to, you've got to feed your spirit man. And the way you feed him is you are feeding on the word of God. You're looking at it and you're speaking it. And one good way to do it is you speak in agreement with the word of God concerning your situation. Let me just give you a little example here. I'll use one that everybody can relate to and that's finances. And so you're looking at your bills and you say, man, this looks insurmountable. And you look at the amount, you say, I'm not sure, I don't know. Is that's kind of a big stretch. That's a big bite for me to believe God to do. So you go to your Bible and you find out every word where it talks about God being a provider. El Shaddai. Uh, Je- uh, Jehovah Jireh. I mean, you can go back to the Old Testament. Uh, you can go back and you can look at how Christ redeemed us, how, or how there was a curse in Deuteronomy 28 and included poverty and how Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. And you're feeding your mind and then you're looking at your circumstances and you're looking at your bills and you begin to speak the word of God to your bills. Yes. I've done that before. I call these bills paid in Jesus' name. And then you check up, am I doing what the word of God says? Am I operating? It's not enough to hear, I have to do. See, if I do, then I, if I've heard and I do, because I've heard what to do and I do what I've heard, we haven't fun yet. When I do that, then I can expect Bible results. Isn't that right? And I can stand on the word of God. I can say, Father God, I've done what you said to do in your word. And I believe that you're not a man that can lie. And I believe because I'm operating the principles of the word of God, I believe it's your will. I know it's your will to meet my need. Right? And then I can even lay out my case. This is the advantage you've got to have. You've got to have ammunition. When Satan came and tempted the Jesus, he knew what was written. Do you know what's written when your temptation comes? You might not be tempted in the same area, but you might be tempted in something else. But do you know what God wrote in his word so that you can answer that temptation when Satan tries to tempt you with it? When he tries to tempt you with going under financially, do you have scripture that you can combat that with? I mean, I'm just saying. Well, what do you mean like that? Those thoughts, I ain't going under. It's impossible for me to go under. 
You got to get bold. I'm not going under. I'm going over. According to the, even the law, he would make me the head and not the tail. Above and not beneath. It also says that if I would seek first the kingdom of God, all these things will be added unto me. I'm seeking the kingdom of God. I am a kingdom seeker. I am putting him first place. I'm going after the things of God. I put God first. I put him over my spouse and over my children and grandchildren. I put him over my, 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 my work and ministry. I put my God before everything else. He said I should have no other gods before him. I don't have any other gods before him. And since I'm seeking him first, these things are automatically going to be added unto me. I found in the word of God where it said that if I would give, it would be given unto me. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Men will pour into my bosom. God, I don't have to worry about this. I'm a giver. And you said because I'm a giver that men are going to pour into my bosom. And Lord, it's not just going to be just a little bit will do you. It's going to be pressed down. Shaken together and running over, you'll cause men to pour into my bosom. Lord, you said that if I would tithe, you would open up the windows of heaven and pour me out a blessing. There's not room enough to receive it. What if I had not taken time to feed on the word? There's people, you might be here today, I don't know, you might not even know some of those scriptures are in the Bible. How do I know they're there? I've spent time feeding on the Word of God. I still spend time feeding on the Word of God. I still put in time looking at the Word of God, feeding my spirit. And this is the thing is you want to get it down here. When you get it in your spirit, then when things happen in life, it's like it's on standby. The Holy Spirit, he lives on the inside of you. He's in your belly, in your innermost being. And it's like, because you have that word there, that something, an emergency, for instance, could, could rear its head right at this moment. But because you have this word of God that you have put in your heart, the Holy Spirit has something. Remember he said that he would bring th all things to our remembrance? He's got something that it's, uh, uh, he's got a word, he's got the scripture inside our belly that he can immediately bring up to our remembrance. And it's almost like he has just then given us standing ground or given us, given us the sword of the Spirit that we can go after the situation that we find ourselves in. That was a long explanation. I'll have to listen to that and see if it made sense. Did it make sense? <laughs> he puts... When the word is hidden in our heart, the psalmist said he's hidden his heart, his word in his heart, so he wouldn't sin against God. But when we put the word in our heart, then when something happens, a situation, a circumstance, the word is already in our heart. We don't have to go find the word because we've paid the price, so to speak, up front. The word is there and it's in reserve. Now, I love this because, you know, if you come to this church, we talk often about being led by the Spirit of God. But you know, one of the greatest ways that God leads us by His Spirit is He brings up the Word that we have put in our heart, and He brings that Scripture up. And that Scripture is Him leading us by the Spirit of God. Now, He can do that. There's times He is, and, and I mean, not just once. This has happened many times where He has brought a Scripture up and I couldn't tell you, I couldn't quote it word for word. I couldn't tell you book, chapter, and verse. But I know it was a word that I had put in my heart. And I think it's good to know book, chapter, verse. Don't get me wrong. But I'm just thankful that the Holy Spirit can work beyond my natural mind. Right? Yeah, some people are more thankful than others. <laughs> I'm thankful for that. Aren't you thankful for that? Yes. That he can, he can bring a scripture, and we can't tell you, you know, chapter or book, chapter, and verse, but it's a scripture that we had evidently put in our hearts. And he brings it up, and it's the perfect scripture. It's the scripture that you can stand on. It's the scripture that you can release your faith on. Yes. Yes. 
So let me encourage you. If you don't have anything you're believing God for, get some things. Brother Hagin used to say things like this. They had a tradition. Everybody came up. You couldn't leave church until everybody came up around the altars. And they'd spend some time just praying. And he said he realized that it was just ritual. That people weren't doing it. They came up there. They really weren't praying. They really weren't believing God for anything. This is just what we have to do before we can go home. And so he said that he, uh, he knew that he had to get this ritual, you know, if, what it become. And so he said, he went down and he started asking. He said, well, what are, you, what are you asking God for? And they said, well, nothing really. And he said, well, then that's what you're going to get. <laughs> nothing really. <laughs> you know, I mean, I chuckle at that too, but it's easy to fall into that. It's easy to not have a, uh, to not have a target, to not have a, not have a bullseye. Not have something we're believing God for. You know, we always do vision. You know, every year we have, a, at the beginning of the year, we have a, talking about putting our vision out there. I mean, I want to encourage you, get that paper out. Yeah. If you threw it away, you should have kept it. Get that paper out and, 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 and look at what you were believing God for to happen in this year of 2017. And get back out there. Get your, get your bullseye. You know, get set, set your sights once again on, on that vision that, that, that you have in your heart to, to come to pass. And so, you know, it's, it's important that we're, that we're targeted in, that we're just not, you know, whatever. And see, if you'll do that, then you can target the Word of God. You can target your, your faith. You'll, you'll see your faith will increase. There's people, and listen, not, and nobody's arrived. Only Jesus was perfect. Because there's people, you can have great faith in one area. There's people, they have great faith with healing. I mean, I mean there's, they just are at a faith level. But they, but, they, but they have hardly no faith when it comes to God meeting their needs. You hear what I'm saying? It doesn't mean that they can't increase their faith about God meeting their needs. It just means that they're going to have to feed their spirit in that area. And let me just put this out there, that most people that have great faith in an area, it's because it's not a gift of faith that God gave them. It's because they developed that area. But let me also say this, that even when you come to that place, it's important that you continue to develop that area. I mean, there's people now who can believe God for $5 million. Serious. I'm serious. There's people who are at a faith level. Some more, they can believe God for it. But I guarantee you, if you sat down and had a conversation with them, they're not settled, they're not, settled, they're not done because they believe God for $5 million. You believe God for $5 million because you've got a big vision. And you've got a big God. And you realize, I have faith in God, and I can't do it on my own. I need God to help me with this. Are you getting anything out of this today? Yeah.